Vice Admiral Matthew Nathan. Um, he has significant military treatment facility and operational experience that includes three command tours. <laughs> He's ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a lot of jobs. I did pretty good. They promoted me, and I'm an admiral. And now it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to all of you. It really is. Dr. Coble, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it is, uh, I'm here for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, some of the concepts we shared this morning. And number two, to thank you, to thank this amazing, proactive, uh, leading-edge community, the Duval uh, Medical Society, the university, all the sponsors and the partners, as you engage uh, our folks at the Navy, Naval Hospital, and as in turn we engage you, uh, the give and the take, we learn a great deal from you, and we hope we can share some things that work for us. Uh, travel is difficult these days, sequestration makes it harder to get away, um, but I got down here and if anybody's going north on 95, I'll share gas with you, okay? <laughs> I hope to move along at a reasonable clip um, and uh, also give you something that's valuable in my, uh, my comments. I was a detailer for an auto agency in high school and I was working on cars one day and the general manager came out and he said, Matt, you may be slow, but you do poor work. And so my goal here today is to be fairly quick and give you something valuable. Uh, it's a pleasure to return to Florida. It's always easy. I received my training here, as you heard, at University of South Florida. I hold my medical license here. And uh, I'm uh, always uh, impressed with uh, if it's going to happen first somewhere in the medical uh, industry, it's going to happen in Florida. And so it's interesting to see how you wrestle with the challenges and the opportunities of this great state. The concepts we heard today are interesting and not only uh, um, fascinating but essential. So the organization that I uh, work for, work with, is one that employs about 64,000 people when you consider the reserve population, the civilians, and the active duty. We have a beneficiary population of over a million and we're part of a larger military health system that serves about 10 million beneficiaries in the TRICARE system. Now, as you know, in most uh, marquee organizations such as yours in the uh, hospital systems here, the standard employee turnover rate usually is somewhere between 1% to 6% a year. Uh, in my organization, it ranges anywhere from 25 to 40%. So I have to have, we have to have in our system uh, a systems approach that is impervious to personnel, impervious to the good employee or the bad employee, the energized provider or the marginalized provider. It must be a systems approach that people move into easily and out of and can translate across the spectrum. So I was fascinated and, and uh, learned a great deal today uh, as you know, um, it is possible to have very complex patient care problems and provide a very safe and quality care environment. I would illustrate that by what's happening in combat casualty care. So uh, if you go back, and many of you had prior service, and thank you for that service, if you go back to World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, the average time that you were grievously injured on the battlefield from the time you eventually were medevaced back to the States to a hospital perhaps in northern Florida or a VA or Bethesda or Walter Reed on average was about 45 to 60 days from the time you were blown up to the time you got back to an ICU or back to a rehabilitation hospital in the States. Now the average time if somebody is in Kandahar today or the Helmand province and they are um, grievously injured and often, more often than not, that means loss of a limb or multiple losses of limbs. Uh, they are in an ICU in our, in our hospital system in three days. Uh, and it is a safe environment. We've never lost one patient, never lost one patient in the air uh, within 72 hours over the, uh, the Atlantic. And so there are, and these are with teams that rotate about every six months about the turnover in the hospitals and the trauma centers in Kandahar and Bastion and Kabul uh, and Basra uh, are 100% about every six months. And so we've 
put systems in place there that allow this kind of life-saving effort. And as you know, if you reach one of those forward resuscitative stations alive, uh, you have a 98% survival rate. And that is, that is uh, literally unheard of. That is not just an incremental increase compared to previous conflicts, that is an orbital increase in what we've learned. And then we share these practices in trauma and resuscitative capability with major centers here and other places. Uh, as we give and take and learn from each other, from the research that's done, and from the communities that give back to us. So again, uh, uh, we're critically interested in anything ranging from team steps, ranging from uh, uh, total quality management principles, and trying to create systems that people, new people coming into the service, people migrating through the service, uh, and people migrating back and forth through the private sector can utilize uh, and become facile with. Uh, patient satisfaction is huge for us. Uh, we now, uh, due to legislation and other uh, uh, federal uh, requirements, our patients often have a choice. They can do TRICARE Prime or uh, Extra or Standard. And so we work hard to be the provider of choice. We work hard to learn from the civilian, private, and academic sector what works to keep our patients engaged and excited about our care. We like to be covenant. When I lecture to uh, house staff and residents, and I still try to teach on occasions, I, when I would attend on the wards at Bethesda, the house staff loved me as, a, at the time, a two-star admiral to be there attending. They, they fought over being on my ward team. And I asked them, I said, is that because you think that I am sort of a seasoned, gray-haired, uh, practicing internists for 40 years who can give you insights and information. They said, no, sir, with you as our attending, we get our consults answered very quickly. <laughs> so I think uh, I'll take it where I can get it. Um, but what I would tell them is I would always lecture them on the three A's that patients look at us for their care. And the three A's in this order are affability, availability, ability. And they would say, why do you put ability last? Why wouldn't that be the most concerning factor on a patient's perspective? And I'd say, well, the ability is presumed. The patient comes in and presumes that if you are practicing, if you are allowed to function at this hospital, if you are given privileges, then you are able to practice. That is presumed. They trust the system enough not 100%, but they trust it enough to believe that you've screened out people who are not able to practice medicine. So after that, they concentrate on your affability, respect, how much they feel that you are engaging in them as an individual, how much you are, and here is the term du jour, centering your care around them. How much of the care is about them, the patient and their family, vice about you? And then after that, they want you to be available. How easily can they get to you? How easily can they be in contact with you? How can they main continu maintain continuity with you? There is nothing more frustrating for a patient than to finally find a provider at any level, be it a physician's assistant, a nurse practitioner, a physician, who has taken great time and effort to learn about them, and then the next time they're seen, the wheel has to be reinvented. And so we're always looking for mechanisms to create patients where they can feel they are at home. They are at home. And in our organization, being at home can be difficult. In our organization, you may be deployed to uh, Djibouti, Africa, uh, Afghanistan, Europe, South America, the Middle East, on an aircraft carrier. And if some illness or injury befalls you, how do, you, how do you feel that you still are medically home? How do you feel that you're going to get care that doesn't go sideways compared to the care that you normally receive at your home facility? And so we're doing everything we can to leverage the electronic medical record and virtual connections to try to provide an environment of home for the patient. And we knew this through a number of ways to try to improve our patient satisfaction. Um, we, uh, in the Navy, we've employed the Disney uh, philosophy and have had Disney come in sometimes and talk to us about their approach. Uh, I have great respect for that system for a couple reasons. Um, 
I brag about Disney. I'm not sure Disney would brag about me. I was an employee there. Uh, back when I was in college during the summer, I worked at the Polynesian Hotel and the water recreation crew. And I always marveled at the fact that knucklehead college students like myself managed to keep this organization from, from suffering untoward issues. Uh, my credit there was that I used to drive um, Pluto and Donald around on the Seven Seas Lagoon on the ski boat. And the three of us really didn't get along. And so one day it came to a head out in the middle of the uh, lagoon and we got into a huge fight. And uh, as college students are sometimes apt to do, we started screaming names at each other while they were bobbing in the water. Uh, and I had let the tow rope go, so they would just sit there for a while. And they were screaming horrible, vile names at me and making gestures at me with their hands. And then we finally got in the boat and fought a little bit, and we came back. The supervisors there who wear blue coats with little mouse emblems on their pockets and sunglasses like secret or service agents and have little earphones was standing there with the mirrored sunglasses as we pulled in. We knew we were in trouble, and he said, okay, you, the dog, and the duck in the office right now. So uh, we went in. And I was put on double secret probation and never allowed to drive the ski boat again, which the Navy was not aware of when they allowed me to, uh, to join. But my, my point is that here's Disney, an organization that uh, hires thousands of young people uh, and puts responsibility on them and manages to pull off a pristine show and performance and reputation. And the Navy and the military is not unlike that. We have hundreds of thousands of young men and women, many between the ages of 18 and 25, who we rely on to be the first point of contact for vital signs, for issues, for noticing illness. We sent independent duty corpsmen out on ships as the only sole senior medical provider for a crew of 300 to 500. And they do the job and they do it well because of the training they receive and because of the systems that we install to use. And so how do we bring all this together to try to uh, create an environment where our patients feel that they are well received, they feel they are not shuffled from provider to provider, and we can maintain continuity with them because many of them are transitory. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, medical home and activating the patient. So I talked about the three A's, and fourth, the fourth A would probably be um, activating a patient, uh, getting a patient to be active in their own health care, getting them to become a stakeholder. That's probably the final frontier. Uh, getting the staff to be stakeholders is the first key at every level. Getting every individual in the staff, and it was mentioned that a housekeeper will call the physician and say, this patient has a problem. We take our lessons from NASA. If you went back to NASA in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and you ask the people who would take the brooms at the end of the day and sweep the halls of NASA and clean out the waste paper baskets, and you'd ask that housekeeper, what is your job here? That person would reply, my job is to put a man on the moon. And so the goal is if you were to go to one of our facilities and ask a housekeeper or ask the gardener or ask somebody else, what is your job here? My job here is to make people's lives better leaving than when they came in. That's my job. And sometimes we can't be the cure. And sometimes we can't be the saving therapy. But we can be there. We can be there. And regardless of whether it is a patient in their eighth decade of life who is slipping away in our hospitals, or it is a Marine slipping away on the battlefield, and you reach out and you squeeze their hand, and they squeeze back. They're not squeezing back to tell you, I'm still here. They're squeezing back to say, don't let me take this journey by myself. Stay with me. Be with me. And so if we can instill that across the spectrum for the dramatic patient care, then I know we can get there for the less dramatic patient care, the encounter every day that we trivialize, but that the patient doesn't. And I'm speaking to the choir here, in that you're called to see your 100th patient of the day in the emergency department. But for them, you're their first provider of the day. 
you're their first encounter. And so how do we make that difference? How do we make them feel they're part of an organization that doesn't pass them from hand to hand, but makes them feel medically at home? How do we activate the patient? And these, I won't go through all these uh, detail by detail, but this is to show what's already intuitive to you, that a patient who is more engaged in their care and who feels that they have a confidence that they can participate in their care uh, is going to have a better outcome. And there are some points there that talk about the range of activation all the way from uh, the patient believing that their role is important, ranging down to staying the course despite stress. And as you know, the majority of money in this country is spent on chronic illness. It is really spent on the patient who has the chronic need for medications, the chronic need for hospitalization, and it's a system that is not in efficiency or running uh, at optimal speed. Um, you know, I really, uh, I really have a hard time and, and don't like people who drop names or try to show their importance by who they know. I was speaking to President Obama um, <laughs> about a year ago when he was coming through Walter Reed Bethesda um, to see the wounded warriors. And we have these brief conversations as we're walking from room to room and, and the discussion was about um, military differences in the health, military federal health care system in the private sector. And I said, well, we have, we have some advantages that they don't have in the private sector. I said, number one, all our patients are insured. I've never ever in the military had to ask a patient how much care they can afford. I've never had to check their health plan to see if it covers this test or covers that test. Number two, we have an electronic medical record. It is cumbersome. It is not optimal. But it does have the reach around the world. And number three, uh, our providers are measured on really the health of their individuals, and we're doing a better job of that. We could be better, but they're measured on the health of their individuals for medical readiness more than the health care. So our, our job is to keep our families and our service members medically ready to do their jobs, and then when necessary, deploy with them. Uh, at the scene to help them. And so these are some of the things that we have going for us. And then how do we get our patients engaged? So again, for patient activation, is it important? And the answer is yes. And these next couple of slides just will document that uh, if you use certain tools and proprietary tools, such as the patient activation, um, um, medium which measurement which is a, uh, a questionnaire which has been shown to be statistically valid in uh, when patients fill it out uh, that the more points they score on that uh, the better their outcomes are again this isn't rocket science I think most of us intuitively know that if we can get our patients engaged in care um, I trained in the private sector I trained at USF I still maintain a closeness with some of my good friends who are in private practice all these years. One of them has a very successful internal medicine practice. It's so successful that they really don't have to take on too many new patients. They have a hard time doing it. And he told me that um, uh, what they do, and, and maybe many of you do this as well, I don't know, but what they do in their practice is that if uh, patients will come in for classes for diabetes, for heart disease, for nutrition, for weight loss, and take documented tests to prove that they've been to the classes and they've learned the material, they will waive their copay on their insurance. Um, they want their patients to be healthy. Uh, and so, again, uh, not all practices could do that, but they're, they're very good. Uh, again, we want to try to do in the military because um, we're not rewarded for care, we're rewarded for health. We want to be like the 15th century Chinese who paid their physicians while they were well. And so in 15th century China, if you were a doctor and you saw your patient about to get run over by an ox cart, you quickly risked your life and pushed them out of the way because you knew if they were injured or laid up, they'd stop paying you. Whereas today, you might see the doctor go, oh, this is going to be a bad accident. So I think we have to uh, look at how we're doing it. And we're seeing more and more systems uh, use this incentive system based on capitation 
and based on others to try to promote health. And that certainly is what the spirit is here, is how do we create a covenant relationship with our patients? How do we create safety? How do we, with all these systems talks and all these acronyms that we've thrown up here uh, previously and, and on my slides, how do we basically just simply intersect right now that patient in that hospital, be it that child or that mom or that dad or that grandfather, who is going to walk out much better than they walked in and who has an infinitesimal chance of suffering at our hands. And we're getting better, but we're not great. One of the things that's been put into effect more than anywhere else, and I'm sure this is in your institutions as well for Joint Commission accreditation for the National Patient Safety Goals, is timeouts. You go almost anywhere and you talk to any operative group of people about timeouts and they can quote it book and verse what the timeout is. Yet, as you know, what is the number one remaining, number one sentinel event that occurs in Joint Commission? By far. It's not close. It's, it's, it's leaps ahead of the second sentinel event. The number one is wrong side surgery. And this comes after years of the National Patient Safety Goal of talking about timeouts. So again, it's culture. It's systems. It's that genetic wiring that was talked about this morning. Because we have everybody who can talk the talk, but we're still not walking the walk. And so again, we're looking for ways that we can integrate the teams and do all the things that were talked about this morning in a collaborative fashion to try to make a difference for our patients. So again, to outline uh, and echo what was said this morning, we have the, uh, the, the paradigm on the left, which is the traditional paradigm where the patient comes in and by one mechanism or another, they seize their provider. The provider says, you know, okay, here's what I'm gonna do for you. Here are your prescriptions, everything else. I'm gonna write a consult for uh, maybe you have some uh, emotional health issues, um, you're not doing well, maybe you need to see the visiting nurse, um, and the patient's not really in the center of this. The provider doesn't really have any visibility other than reports that come back to them, and they often don't, on what's happening to the patient in the ancillary support services. Now you go to medical home where you put the patient in the center, and the provider works in a pod of people. And I know many of you have instituted medical home, but works in a pod of people. And that pod uh, may include a, uh, a licensed health provider, be it a physician assistant and a provider, uh, a nurse, a medical assistant, a nutritionist, uh, ready access in the primary care clinic to behavioral health uh, care. Um, because we found that now in the military more than anything else, and as you know, uh, amputations are a very serious injury. I don't trivialize them. There's been about 1,500, a little more, over the last 10 years of people who have lost their limbs due to this war. They've survived uh, to, um, because uh, the, other the other advances that have been made have allowed people who, who lost limbs in previous wars didn't survive. So in this war, they do. Uh, but it also creates traumatic brain injury and it creates tr post-traumatic stress. And so last year alone in the Navy and Marine Corps, we had about 13,000 people who suffered TBI, mild to moderate TBI, and on top of that, post-traumatic stress. And so we have this tsunami coming back of people with PTS and TBI. And the TBI comes from the, the war, but it also 80% of it comes from getting hit on the basketball court or motorcycle into the, into the um, uh, divider lane or whatever. But again, this is a community issue. The military alone can't solve this, this tsunami of people coming back with PTS and TBI. And as you know, many of these folks in this very, very military supportive community here in North Florida will roll up on your shores. And again, it's going to be a community outreach answer that's going, to have to reach, that's going to have to fix this. And we've learned in the military, this has to start at the primary care level. We don't succeed if we simply take the primary care issues of these folks with these vexing injuries of traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress and just put out their primary care fires and then send them off to the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the social worker, etc. We have to do it collaboratively at the time of the entrance examination. And that's why engendering behavioral health so that I can see the patient as an internist and decide that you know what your problem is, 
um, you have a little bit of this, but you also have a, a depression that's going on. And rather than have you get a consult and put it in, I need you to walk down the hall and see the behavioral spouse specialist or get you in the same day. So these are the kind of things, putting it in the uh, in, in pa patient in the center, uh, and again, the case managers become critically important in this environment. And this is just to show that um, in patients who have a high score on their patient activation, those who have recognized their role, who have confidence, who have said during stressful times when I'm not feeling well or when I'm having other family issues or when I'm having other distractors, I still recognize that I have to put my health first uh, and will do so and almost sign a contract to do it, that these folks uh, have a significant improvement in some of these HEDIS measurements. These are just three uh, organizations that have seen the utility uh, from a bottom line perspective of uh, patient activation from Geisinger to the VA uh, to uh, Community Health Care of North Carolina. It really talks about case management and it basically says uh, we're going to have a case manager in our medical home, in our pod, and so let me give you an example in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps used to do, and for those of you who either served in that or, or know it, it used to be the famous morning-afternoon sick call. So you go to the Marine Corps Battalion Aid Station, and in the morning there was a thousand Marines lined up, and they all came in one by one to see the corpsman or the doc, and the doc saw them, and if they needed something, the doc gave them a referral uh, to a specialist or to the hospital, and then the chances were the Marine might or might not keep that appointment. Uh, and the doc didn't know. Uh, because there was no case management. Now we've changed that medical home in many of our Marine Corps. We've changed it to a medical home in our Marine Corps. We've uh, um, moved the care inside the hospitals and inside the clinics. The Marines now come in, and when they're given an appointment, it also tickles the case manager, who then follows up on an electronic data file and sees that two or three days later, they have not made the referral or completed the referral. And they call the Marine up. And as you've heard before, we have a little easier time of taking care of our patients in the sense that we can order them to see the doctor. And so I wish I could do that with all of them. As an internist, I wish I could order everybody to go to the dietician or order everybody to go to the smoking cessation. But we do have that advantage. Um, and we can at least get the person to the provider. Uh, so that case management has really changed the paradigm. And the Marines, which were skeptical at first, uh, now wouldn't have it any other way. Again, another bar graph showing proactive uh, patient uh, contacts uh, and empowering the patient uh, gets them to go up. Our, our sort of our model for this is Pensacola. Jacksonville is making great strides now. And Jacksonville, in fairness, has a huge huge uh, patient population uh, compared to Pensacola. I was the commanding officer at Pensacola, and uh, it has a, a smaller patient population to manage. It has a higher provider ratio, uh, and it has more of a captured patient's population. Uh, Jacksonville is, uh, I was touring the hospital yesterday with, uh, with uh, Captain uh, Schaefer. They're doing a magnificent job now of harnessing their patients, getting them in medical home, uh, and advertising it. Um, medical home is not something that is intuitively normal for most people, and it certainly, uh, if it works right, and this is going to sound um, a little bit contradictory to what I was saying, if medical home works right, then you won't see the patients as often. So a sea story, as we say in the Navy, I'm the commander at Bethesda, and the medical home champions come to me. And this, we hadn't really done it in the Navy in any significant degree yet. And they came to me and they said, boss, will you give us some money to build a medical home? And I said, where are you going to build it? They said, we'd like to take some of the internal medicine patients and put them in medical home. And I said, OK, here's some money uh, to go out and buy the asynchronous messaging, the relay healthcare system so that your patients can connect to you electronically on the web. You can push information on the web. You can email them. You can call them. You can use smoke signals for all I care. But uh, that's the plan. And so uh, after about six months, and I would go down to the normal internal medicine clinic and see patients. And normal internal medicine clinic was always like a pizzeria on a Friday night. People screaming, running around, I need this, so-and-so is supposed to be admitted. Has anybody seen this patient's record? What's happening here? 
And so after about eight months, six to eight months, I walked over to the medical home for the first time because they didn't want me to see it until it was really going strong. Remember, they took half the patients on a randomized basis. They took half the internal medicine patients, about 20,000, I guess, and split them off and took them in medical home. So I walk over to medical home, mood lighting, music, nobody's there. The only sound you can hear is little bubbles in the aquarium. And I said, this isn't medical home, this is home alone. <laughs> and I stuck my head in the pod, you know, I opened the door and the providers are in there and they're sitting up and they're on the computer looking at things and hitting web pages and doing other things. And I said, where are all the patients? And they said, sir, uh, you know, they're not here. We take care of them electronically. And I said, well, let me pull the HEDIS measurements. So I pulled the HEDIS measurements, and that medical home was the first Navy facility in history to hit all eight HEDIS measurements in the green. So their patients at the 90% level had their A1Cs, their mammography, their colorectal screening, everything in the green. So let me pull the ER utilization down 20% compared to the normal internal medicine clinic. Let me pull the hospitalization down 20% compared to the... Uh, now, for some of you, as I say, hospitalization's down, ER utilization down, depending on your remuneration system, that's good or bad news. But for us, that's very good news. So then I said to them, so really, you're only having to see the patient when they're sick. Oh, yes, sir, they can, we can, their pharmacy, they can have their meds delivered to their door, we can use the computer to do the diabetic teaching, we can use the computer to do the Coumadin teaching. Um, they can respond to us on our, on our iPhones. Uh, we can go back and forth. It's just great. Um, we just don't have to see them for the usual stuff because we're, we're, uh, we're using all this electronic leverage and uh, the patients really like it. And I said, okay, now the idea is you enroll more patients. Do you understand that? Oh, we hadn't thought of that. I said, you see, that's how we're going to save money because instead of you each seeing 1,200 patients in your enrollment panel, you're now going to see 2,000. And they said, well, that might be a little more work for us. And I said, I know it's a foreign concept, but, but try to wrap your arms around it. And, and so that's how we're going to change the game in our population. We're going to be able to do more work efficiently by harnessing that. Why is that important in Navy medicine? Because I'm responsible for Navy and Marine Corps, and I have ships at sea right now, and I've got to figure out a way to do more virtual care. I have to do that. I have an electronic medical record that communicates very well within the Navy. We could go to my office in D.C. and I could tell you what's happening on an aircraft carrier medically in the South China Sea in real time. The x-ray results, the lab results, the medicines that were given to the sailor, but I can't communicate to the VA that's eight miles away. So we've got to break that paradigm too with the electronic medical record. We've got to be able to find a seamless connection. And I believe the, the slide was really meant to be asynchronous communication, meaning that um, these are things that the doctor and the, the provider and the patient don't have to be uh, on at the same time, but this is how we push things out to our patients. And we're getting there. Uh, at Naval Hospital Jacksonville, they range from anywhere to 20% to about 40% of their patients are registered online for Relay Health, which is their mechanism to communicate by web. It is a cultural change. It is a demographic change. For those of us like myself who are older uh, and are taking care of older patients, they're much more comfortable with coming in to see the doctor. They're much more comfortable with being seen eye to eye, and older providers are more comfortable with that. Our younger patients are not. Our younger patients have no desire to come to the hospital. They're dialed in. They want to do everything electronically. They want to do it on the app on their iPhone, and they want to communicate the way I communicate with my 16-year-old daughter. When I want her to come downstairs for dinner, I text her, <laughs> come down to dinner. And when she doesn't come down, my wife says, would you yell at her to come down? So I text her in all capital letters. <laughs> come down to dinner. And then she texts back in all caps, OK. And then she comes stomping down the stairs. So she's going to be somebody who's not going to want to have to drive and, and circle a parking lot and find a space and then pay for parking and then walk in to simply see a doctor or a provider or a follow-up for no good reason. And if I can keep those patients at bay and let them walk in with open access where they don't need an appointment to come in for medical home and they can just walk in and be seen, um, then all of a sudden, interestingly enough, the patient visits drop. They drop because our patients no longer make prophylactic appointments. If mom 
has a three-year-old, and that three-year-old starts coughing a little bit, and mom says, uh-oh, I know what this is going to be. This is going to be an ear infection. So she calls up and makes an appointment for two days later because she knows they're hard to get. And then it turns out to be nothing. She doesn't cancel the appointment. And so that appointment goes fallow. Now mom trusts us. She knows I don't have to make an appointment. If in two days Jimmy's ear is really bothering me, I can walk him in and be seen. So all of a sudden with open access, our appointment uh, burden drops. And so we can enroll more patients. And the patient involvement, you've talked about that to some extent, involving patients all the way from the executive committee to making rounds to using them as focus groups. Uh, we do that in many of our centers. We try to get the patients uh, as part of the uh, solution and get their perspective. I think we're, we're doing well at that. Um, we are stressing very much patient uh, and family-centered care. I don't think you can get there without the patient's perspective. Uh, and I think that uh, much of the good uh, discussion that came this morning was enlightening to me. And uh, one of the things I'm going to take away from this is perhaps putting a survey in at our facilities, um, an anonymous, an, an, a, sur a survey that doesn't, is, it's not disclosed to the general population of the hospital, but feedback mechanisms for all our providers from their ancillary support staff as to who they feel comfortable talking to, speaking with, um, giving feedback to, saying something's wrong. And I think that's very enlightening. And when we can show our providers of any, of any type some sort of bar graph that shows where they are, be it in their RVU production, be it in their patient health production, be it in how many of their patients have the A1Cs or the LDLs compared to somebody else. Boy, is that Hawthorne effect a motivator. I don't have a financial motivator. I can't all of a sudden bestow somebody more pay or take it away. I, I work in a federal bureaucracy. It's very cumbersome. But most of our people function very, very well based on pride uh, of work. And so I, I've, I've learned that, and I think we're going to leverage that from what I've learned here. This just simply shows that uh, for patient medical home, uh, it's a no-brainer. The continuity of care goes way up. And if you talk to most of our patients over history, they would tell you, um, I am very, uh, very happy when I get in to see you, but it's hard to get in to see you. And when I do get in to see you, sometimes I have to see a different provider. So we're changing that. Again, just a slide that shows in the Navy, I think we're making great strides in uh, um, lowering our ER utilization. And for us, uh, that's really money in the bank. Because not only do, do we pay for people who come to our own ERs, but when they come to your ERs, and you know this in the area from the TRICARE uh, prime coverage, uh, we pay for that as well. So that's all coming out of the taxpayer's dollars. So we're trying to limit that. And again, we're trying to promote health vice health care. Uh, my wife bought me a, uh, she said, you got to really uh, practice what you preach. So she bought me a Fitbit. And she said, she'd put, I'd have to wear it. You know, it measures how many steps you take during the day. And so she'd check it at night when I'd come home to see, because Tammy's kind of a fitness nut. And she'd check it. And I got so tired of getting yelled at, I'd finally find a couple people who were going for a run. And I'd say, hey, you want to make five bucks? <laughs> so she was very impressed until somebody, dime, somebody dropped a dime on me and, and told her that I was paying people to run my Fitbit. Um, so this, uh, I think this is the final slide, and basically it just says that partnership with patients uh, is the key ingredient. So uh, what I wanted to convey to you today is we have a large system, we have a system of transient personnel, we have to put in systems fixes, we have patient population that move a lot, we've got to make them feel medically home, and we have to make them feel as stakeholders uh, for their care. Uh, again, um, we do that as a community. We don't exist as an island. So many of our patients migrate to and fro for you, with you, and uh, see you for urgent care, see you for referred care. I can tell you that um, with, without exception, every person I've talked to at the hospital here feels embraced by this community, feels engaged by this community, and is proud to be not only just a citizen of this community, but a medical member of this community. So I thank you very much for that on behalf of the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And I thank you in advance on behalf of, be it that military or that civilian, uh, young, young girl or boy or man or woman or husband or wife or grandfather or grandmother, uh, who as a result of your collective passions today in looking to make the handoff safe into our system and the handoff safe out of our system, 
I thank you in advance on behalf of them. They don't know who you are, but because of your good work today and, the, and your perseverance in this, uh, their lives will be changed for the better. Thank you for your time and allowing me to talk to you. That was inspiring, and uh, obviously a lot of changes are ahead for a lot of us, and you are leading the way in some of them. Uh, our chair of the Safety 